Welcome to another Royal Astronomical Society's online public talk. Hello, I am Lucinda Offer, Education Outreach and Bicentenary Events Officer for our 200th anniversary of the Royal Astronomical Society. Our organization advocates for astronomy, geophysics, and space science in the UK since 1820. This will be our final bicentenary talk for the last 200th anniversary. We are still continuing our public talks and have one next week on the 15th. But this being our final uh, bicentenary talk makes it that much more special. And I am so excited to have with us Dr. Aprajita Verma, who will speak with us about the European Southern Observatory's extremely large telescope, otherwise known as the ELT, which will be the world's biggest eye on the sky, operating in the visible and infrared wavelength range, and will collect 13 times more light than the largest visible infrared telescopes today, allowing us to peer deeper and further in the universe than ever before. Amazing. And Dr. Aparajita Verma is a senior researcher and project scientist for the UK Extremely Large Telescope Program at the University of Oxford. After receiving her PhD, followed by a short postdoc in the astrophysics group at Imperial College in London, she became science research staff at the Max Planck Institute for extraterrestrial physics and subsequently joined the sub-department of astrophysics at the University of Oxford. Also very amazing. So I will let her tell you about her research interests, but I love that you were a founding member of uh, Space Warps Aprahita, which is part of the Zooniverse Science, a citizen science project to find gravitational lenses. Finally, she is also a co-chair of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory Strong Lensing Science Collaboration. And I should make sure I said Aprajita. I apologize if I mispronounced that. A quick reminder that there will be a Q&A after the talk, so please get your questions ready. There are places to post your questions in our for our speaker if you've joined us on Zoom in the Q&A box and on YouTube in the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Verma, for being with us today and to celebrate our 200 years of the Royal Astronomical Society. On to you. Thank you very much, Lucinda. I'm really honoured to be here and thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, as Lucinda so eloquently mentioned, I'm going to tell you about a really exciting programme, uh, which is related to the Extremely Large Telescope, which, as Lucinda said, will be the world's largest telescope operating in the optical to infrared uh, wavelength regimes. It's uh, a really exciting project to be involved with and I've had the pleasure of working on it for about a decade, but several others have been working on it for much longer than I. And this really is the culmination of a huge amount of work uh, from a lot of people. And it's just so exciting to still, to actually see this come to fruition. Um, so as Lucinda mentioned, it's, it's being built by an organization called the European uh, Southern Observatory. Um, and this is, basically a uh, international organization with 16 member states. So uh, you see all their flags uh, along the bottom there. Um, and also a partner with Chile, uh, who have a 10% share in ESO facilities in, in return for the land. And Australia is a strategic partner of ESO as well. Um, and this really is the priority for their uh, next stage of development of their instruments, uh, of their telescope suite. Um, and here it is, this is one of the latest uh, computer generated renditions of what the ELT will look like when it's completed. Um, it is a monster in terms of um, how large it is. It has, as Lucinda mentioned, a very large uh, mirror, uh, which is 13 mi nine meters across. It's also an adaptive telescope that I'll talk about a bit later. And it works from the visible wavelengths right through to the mid infrared. Um, it was approved to start construction in December, 2012. Um, and we're expecting first light um, around the mid of this decade. Now, this isn't cheap. Uh, it's 1.3 billion euros, and, and ESO have just approved uh, that level of funding to complete the project in its full form. Um, and it really is a top priority for European and, in fact, international ground-based astronomy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about other extremely large telescopes a bit later in the in the talk. Um, but as you can see, this kind of level of funding is not um, possible by single countries anymore. So it really is an international collaboration and this kind of level of cost requires us all to work together. And that brings the additional benefit of garnering all that international expertise into this world-class facility. 
Um, so, so why do we want to build big telescopes? Um, and often you'll, you'll hear about, oh, and there's this other large telescope and this large telescope. And then as you can imagine, the name of the ELT may not be the most inspiring, um, but basically big telescopes are really important for us in terms of how astronomy is developing. And I think by all means, we should still see it as um, an open and active area of research. There's still so many unanswered questions. So astronomy very much is still in a state of exploration and it's really assisted um, by technology. And so uh, developments in te technologies, in engineering, in computing, they've all helped us to get to this really highly um, complex way of, of observing the universe. Um, and sometimes uh, we can't do everything we want because the technology doesn't exist. But at times that has caused us to kind of be inventive and create technologies that have not just helped astronomy, but also the wider, has wider applications. For example, um, Wi-Fi uh, chips in your mobile devices, in your laptops, are a result of development in radio astronomy. Um, and you can you can all ben, uh, see, see what benefit that has brought. Also in adaptive optics, again, that I'll talk about a bit later, has also had implications in, in medical imaging. So there's a lot of things that we don't necessarily know are going to impact other areas outside astronomy, but it really is an innovative subject. So I think the bottom line is the science kind of drives um, us to build large telescopes to both look at um, problems that we know exist, as well as make fundamental new discoveries. Um, it also kind of promotes innovative science, innovative technology, computing and engineering. And this really is big aspects of all of those coming together to enable this uh, facility. And also it's an opportunity for us to communicate how wondrous the universe is to um, everyone but also to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. So I'm going to move now just to talk a little bit about the background of how we got to large telescopes. Um, and I'm going to start right at the very beginning. This, uh, it's a, a painting that was done, I think, 200 years later than Galileo's life, but it kind of imagined him uh, having star parties with his telescope, which he uh, basically originated modern astronomy by using a magnifying spyglass developed by Lippehe to look at the universe. And, you know, he, he really focused on getting really high quality uh, optics into his um, telescopes, particularly on the lenses. And he was able to achieve kind of like 20 times magnification. And on the right here, you can see some of the amazing things he saw um, by doing that. So he, he uh, catalogued sunspots, um, the moon's craters and prominences. Um, he also was the first one to see the moons of Jupiter, uh, note the phases of Venus and also the ears of Saturn. And at that time, this must have been incredibly um, amazing stuff to see. So the telescope that, um, that Galileo used was a refractor, so that uses lenses. And here you see um, kind of just a, a simple ray diagram schematic of how that works. So the light comes in, it gets uh, focused by the first lens to the eyepiece where it's magnified. Now, I think the thing that I really wasn't aware of that um, the ELT really isn't the first large telescope. Um, there was actually a 45 meter refractor uh, built in 1673 by uh, Hevelius. Um, and he saw amazing things along with uh, Cassini and Huygens who each used refractors of, of huge sizes to look at things like uh, make accurate lunar maps um, and see Saturn's moons. So, but as you can imagine, and as you can see in this, um, this uh, drawing down here, that basically you need kind of rooftop scale, huge uh, constructions just to steer and manage these things. So while they're, they're big, they're actually cumbersome to use. So then along came Newton, who developed a ref uh, the first reflecting telescope. And again, you see a ray diagram here where the, you actually use a mirror to initially focus the light that's then reflected off to the eyepiece where it's magnified and observed. And this really changed 
how modern telescopes are built because they could then be far more compact and far more uh, practical. And moving on to uh, the 19th century, this technique uh, or the use of reflecting telescopes was really uh, pioneered by um, strangely three Williams um, that I've highlighted here, but of course there were several others who were working on this. Um, but I think we can't go without mentioning William Herschel who actually developed 400 telescopes during his lifetime and really focused on getting good quality optics. And he was actually the first to cast a mirror that was then large and, and even by today's standards is still large of 1.26 meters. Um, and then William Parsons, uh, who was the third Earl of Ross, um, built the Leviathan of Parsons Town, which is 1.83 meters. And it actually remained the world's largest telescope well into the 20th century. Um, and William Lassell really then took astronomy to a more precise level in the sense that he, he really focused on the engineering of the telescopes. He was the first to use an equatorial mount, track stars as the sky rotates. Um, he also considered putting his telescope in, in dark places and he had telescopes in Malta um, and he discovered Triton 17 days after Neptune's discovery. So these people really drove innovative um, telescope engineering, but also developed the field of astronomy. Then across the uh, Atlantic, we moved to um, the US where George Ellery Hale was a, a significant pioneer of many large telescopes. Um, we have the Yerkes Observatory with a 40 inch uh, refracting telescope, but also Mount Wilson, a 60 inch reflector and a 100 inch um, hooker telescope. And that culminated in his development of the uh, Hale telescope, which was 200 inch reflector that you can see down here at the end and really was ahead of its time and remained the largest mirror well into the 20th century. And now this is just the compilation of where we are today in terms of the world's largest optical and infrared telescopes. Um, so here you see just a selection. Again, there's also others um, such as Grand Tacan and Salt, but I'm gonna focus on um, the very large telescopes, which you see here and the Paranal Observatory, which is also built by the European Southern Observatory. And these are four eight meter telescopes. Up here you also have um, the Gemini North and South telescopes, which are also uh, eight meters roughly across. And then the, t uh, the Keck telescopes right here at the bottom, which are twin 10 meter telescopes. And here you see that we're, we're kind of looking at Paranal, Hawaii and, Ch uh, sorry, Hawaii, Chile um, for these sites of these amazing telescopes. So one thing that drastically changed from uh, where Hale built his 200 inch mirror is if you look at the pictures here on the left, you see this is the actual mirror blank. Um, so this is basically made of glass that took two years to pour. And if you see down here, this is actually the structure that supports the Hale telescope. And this is actually based on battleship technology. So I hope that you can kind of get a sense of this is really strong, sturdy stuff, right? This mirror is very massive and requires a really strong structure to help it move, but it's still remarkable to see this telescope in operation because it moves incredibly smoothly and with incredible precision, despite all this heavy weight um, that needs to be carried around. We then have the w William Herschel telescope, um, mirror which you see here that was cast um, or the Herschel telescope had first light in 1987 um, and this is its mirror which you see is substantially thinner but it was still um, about half a meter thick. Now if we look at the Gemini telescope mirror which you see down here um, and this is basically very different in the sense that it, it's really much thinner. It, it has um, it's about two percent of its uh, diameter and this is really the innovation in mirrors that has allowed big mirrors and big telescopes to be developed. So if you compare on the right here, Gemini structure to that of Palomar, you can see that you've kind of lost that very heavyweight, heavy engineering to a very lightweight system that allows the telescopes to be very flexible. 
um, and steerable and easy to move. And it also means that we can actually make mirrors that are this large. Um, if Gemini was built with the same kind of ratios as the WHT mirror, it would actually be um, a meter thick. So it's really a, a big difference. And the thing that's coupled with that is a system called active optics, which basically preserves the shape of the mirror underneath by using a support structure. So that means you can lose the weight, but still support um, the mirror surface and keep its perfect shape as you track uh, celestial objects. Another thing about, um, in terms of the technological developments, uh, mirror polishing has also become extremely um, high precision. So to get um, the kind of quality of surface that you need for large mirrors these days, about 10%, it's generally about 20% of the wavelength, but basically the numbers that you see here are telling you how precise the variations in that mirror need to be. So while the diameter of the VLT mirror is 8.2 meters, the precision that's required on that surface is uh, four zeros and then five millimeters. So it's kind of really, really small scale. And just to put that number into some context, um, you can kind of imagine that as ripples in water of a few centimeters high, but spread over the entire Atlantic Ocean. That's the kind of quality that mirror manufacturers are now able to produce on uh, optical mirror surfaces. So why are we talking about bigger and bigger telescopes? And I think the key thing here is that, firstly, the more mirror surface you have, the more light you're collecting from the universe. So therefore you have more sensitivity and it allows you, it's a bit like your pupils dilating in the dark. It just means you collect more photons, but also the scale or the resolution that we can see um, or the detail we see in objects is, um, improves if we go to larger mirrors. So we can therefore get a deeper and a finer view of the universe. And this is really what's driving, these two things combine, drives this need or desire to go to bigger telescopes. Because um, for example, if you look at things that are nearby in the Milky Way, our current limitation may be that we're just not getting enough detail. Um, looking back to things that are formed, uh, galaxies that formed early in the universe, while we can find them, we still don't really know what their structures are like. So these two things can really help us address many, many science questions that I'll talk about a bit later. So I've kind of given you an idea of, of what, uh, how mirror size has progressed, but I'm gonna now talk about how big this monster is. And here you see um, a nice graphic from ESO uh, compared to Big Ben that I hope you're all familiar with. Um, so you can see it's really quite large. Um, in terms of modern professional use telescopes, um, this shows the size evolution of mirrors from the 1900s right through to the present day. And here you see the five meter Hale telescope uh, that I mentioned before. And the size of these blue circles that you see on the plot basically are related to the size of the mirror. So that you've got the 2.5 meter hooker, um, the five meter Hale, and then a cluster of similar sized object of telescopes. Here you see the WHT. So you can see how kind of clearly ahead of its time the Hale telescope was. Um, you can see Hubble up here and here these larger circles are representing those telescopes that I showed you a bit earlier, the eight to 10 meter class telescopes with the GTC, the Grand Tacan telescope on La Palma here. Now I'm gonna show you um, how the ELT looks in comparison. Now you can see it really is a monster. It actually is larger in terms of its collecting area as all those telescopes combined. So it really is a, a significant change in collecting power in these wavelengths than we've had before. I just have this uh, small mention for um, amateur astronomers. Um, so this little green circle is currently the world's largest um, public observatory um, that was set up by Mike Clements from a rescued mirror um, from, I believe, some military use. Um, and this is uh, working now in America and is the world's largest amateur telescope. So how do we make these large mirrors? So I think I showed you earlier the, the, um, the VLT and the Gemini mirrors are single panel eight meter across telescopes. Um, and that actually is the largest mirror that can be manufactured uh, currently to the required precision. So how do you build a mirror 
that is 40 meters across. And I'm sure some of you have already cottoned on to what that is. But actually, I think what's really interesting is noting that this technology, which I hope will come up, actually was pioneered almost about the same time as the Hale telescope was, was uh, developed. So Guido Horn de Arturo at Bologna University built the first segmented mirrors. And he actually built the first multi-mirror telescope, which had a mirror that was 1.8 meters across. And so this is not new, um, but it's really what's allowed us to build larger and larger telescopes. So for example, um, I showed you the Keck telescopes, the twin 10 meter telescopes earlier. And this is a picture of, of their mirror, which is made using that technology. So um, this is what allows us to now build bigger and bigger telescopes. So just to put this in, in a context of, of other large telescopes, I mentioned we're not the only extremely large telescope around. There are also two projects led by uh, US consortia. Uh, one is the Giant Magellan Telescope, which you see up here, and a picture of the Giant Magellan Telescope is down here. Um, and also the 30 meter telescope, which is um, being led by a, a consortium of US universities and international partners. And down along the bottom here, you see the ELT compared to many of those large telescopes we, we talked about, uh, the Keck, um, the GTC, um, and this is the Rubin telescope that uh, Lucinda, Lucinda mentioned in, in the introduction, and also the VLTs. And here you see how large even the ELT compares to any of these facilities, and also to Hubble, whose little mirror you see up there at 2.4 meters, and also the very exciting James Webb Space Telescope that will be launched next year, which also uses hexagonal mirrors to fill its 6.5 uh, mirror aperture. So I think while ELT and TMT will use also very similar, I think 1.4 meter hexagonal mirrors to make up their mirror apertures. One thing to note for GMT is they're actually using kind of like a, a petal design for their um, mirrors, which is basically seven, eight meter class mirrors, which they can make to very high quality um, to fill their aperture. That of course leaves gaps, but it, it doesn't compromise the kind of resolution that you can achieve. So again, just to give you some size references. Um, so this is a standard size 105 meter football pitch. And this is how much the ELT primary mirror would be uh, in relation to that. So next time you're at a football match, just imagine basically half of one half of the, of the pitch would be covered by mirrored surfaces. Um, in my abstract, I mentioned Stonehenge. So um, as you can see here, Stonehenge is, um, the mirror is slightly larger, about 20% larger than the Sarsen circle that you see out here. And then what is just right is actually, thanks to uh, an old an ex-student of uh, Oxford, Simon Zielineski, who found actually the world's largest pizza has the same diameter or roughly the same diameter as uh, the ELT primary mirror. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about the primary mirror that you see here in, in more detail. So um, this is just a fly through movie that will show you the inside of the ELT um, uh, or a simulation of, of the inside of the ELT. Um, so the primary mirror is actually made up of basically nearly 800 segments, which are each about 1.4 meters across. Now they're made out of really low thermal expansion glass. So that means that they're very uh, insensitive to changes in temperature. And the reason that that's important is that it allows the um, mirror surface to be preserved. Each of these segments are removable, and in fact, one or two of them will need to be removed and cleaned each day to preserve the quality of the mirror surface. Now, each of these hexagonal mirrors, um, uh, you see one example here, has um, these three pistons behind them that basically are this active optics that I mentioned earlier that basically preserve the shape by um, changing each individual segment to fit this or to maintain this parabola of parabolic mirror as it moves and tracks uh, celestial objects. 
And so you see the, the mammoth structure here, and here's just a cutout of the kind of structure that sits underneath those cells to support it. So all in all, this whole structure has about a thousand components in it. And this actually is a prototype of one of those mirror segments. And here you see those pistons um, in more detail. And also down here, uh, each segment has three, um, but also it has six, so two on, sorry, 12, two on each um, of the flat sides of the mirror edge sensors. Now they basically continuously monitor where its neighbor is um, and then feeds this back into kind of the piston system that's basically constantly changing the shape of the individual mirror so that they know exactly where they are next to the next mirror and they can, can preserve that shape. And so it's a really complex system, um, but it's a system that has been used in Keck, so we know that it works. Um, and these components are now at their final uh, design phase um, and they're about to ready to be going go into manufacturing. So the whole mirror system for the ELT is actually a five mirror design. So there you see the primary mirror along the bottom. Uh, the light comes in, hits the primary mirror, as you'll see, I'll start again now, um, and it gets reflected on M2, which is at the top, down to um, M3, up to M4, then to a fold mirror, which basically just sends the light out to the sides where the instruments will, the platforms where the instruments will sit. So this is a really innovative design um, in terms of how um, the mirror design is, but it also means that the ELT um, will be able to do adaptive optics, which I'll talk about a bit later. Just to put this into perspective, a little while earlier, I spoke about the William Herschel telescope. Um, and here are pictures of the William Herschel telescope and its mirror. And M2 basically is the same size as this four meter, 4.2 meter mirror. So essentially you're, you're suspending the whole of this very, already very large mirror on top of this enormous mirror. I always find that quite amusing. And this is just a, a, a look at what the um, M2 mirror will actually look like within its structure. So this is the telescope structure overall. As I mentioned, you have these two platforms where the instruments will sit. And I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by instruments. But again, just to give you a size reference, um, these two platforms here are about the size of a tennis court. And way down here, you can see a little man who's not actually little, but life size. So again, gives you an idea of how large this enormous telescope would be. Um, it's about 3,700 tons, yet it's motor driven to a precision of 0.3 arc seconds, which is incredible. And just the fact that this whole enormous system will be able to track objects as they move across the sky um, is really a feat of engineering. So I did mention instruments, so I want to talk a little bit about what they are. So as you can imagine, we would have a camera, um, which would take images of any regions of the sky, as you would imagine but we'll also have um, spectrographs. So these then take the light of the, um, that uh, is collected, but splits it into smaller wavelength bins. And that's really uh, helpful because it allows us to understand, well, we can gain so much knowledge from more than just colors of, of celestial objects. We can learn about the kind of elements in them. We can learn about how gas or those elements are moving and really try and or disentangle what the nature of objects are. So there's actually a whole suite of instruments planned for the ELT that I won't go into in any detail, but they're basically a mixture of images and, and spectrographs and sometimes imaging spectrographs, which means that basically for every pixel of your image, you actually get a spectrum rather than just a single measure. So we can basically look at, for example, this galaxy here, and by pointing an integral field spectrograph at, at it, we could look at the kind of conditions in, in, a, in many pixels across this entire galaxy. And that can tell us, as you can already see, that there's a big difference here between the center and the outskirts, but there's also this apparent dust lane here, and we can see all those things reflected in the spectra. So these three instruments that I'm just showing here on the left, Harmony, uh, Mikado and Metis are the first light instruments for the ELT. And Harmony is actually being led by uh, Professor Niranjan Thate at Oxford. Um, and of all these instruments, the UK are involved 
in all seven of them, apart from Mikado. So this is a really big project for UK uh, astronomy and UK instrumentalists. And we've taken a leading role and a significant role in several, in, in fact, all but one of these instruments. So I'll talk a little bit about the dome, uh, which is just basically um, passed it, its final design review and is ready and uh, for manufacture and the final build phase. And here you see kind of just how incredible it is. It's really like doing astronomy on football arena type scales. So here again, I've showed you the football pitch and the white circle that you see enclosing the primary is roughly the footprint of this dome, uh, which will be about 88 meters across and about 80 meters high. Uh, it's fully air conditioned and seismically isolated. And it's again, a very heavy structure, 6,500 tons. Um, and it rotates a, a, on a concrete block, but again, it has to follow, obviously, the telescope as we track and observe objects in the sky. Um, so again, this is really precision engineering that allows us to do this on these scales in this incredible way. So I've already kind of said where this is, but you might imagine that um, telescopes, as you know, are placed in regions where um, we have dark skies. And actually the ELT, as I mentioned, is being built in Chile. So I mentioned the very large telescopes a bit earlier and they're basically basically sighted here on Paranal. Um, and Amazonas up here is where the ELT will or is being built. That's about 23 kilometers away um, as the crow flies from Paranal. Um, but that also meant while other sites were investigated, I think another seven sites internationally were um, investigated. Amazonas was chosen because um, it's a great site. I mean, Chile has extremely clear and dry nights, um, but also because some of the infrastructure between Paranal and Amazonas could be shared. And I think um, the background picture here just really shows you how spectacular um, this area of the world is. It's in the Atacama Desert. It's roughly at about an elevation of um, 3000 meters. Um, but what I mentioned about the quality of the observing sky there, if you look at this Google map uh, picture of Chile down here, that little red flag there is Amazonas and Paranal. And basically you can see that it's actually, and you can see it kind of here as well. This is uh, the ocean down here, but you can see it's actually not too far away from the ocean, but yet you're going up very quickly to about 3000 meters. And that's exactly the reason why the weather is so stable. Um, because basically the bad weather hits that landmass and doesn't come over. So there's about 320 uh, clear nights of observing, if not more, in the year. Um, this background picture also shows you kind of the quality of the site. So way back here, there's um, Chile's, I believe, third largest peak. Uh, it's actually an active volcano, um, but it's about 190 kilometers away. And from the kind of quality of this image, gives you a feeling that even though it's 190 kilometers away, it's got spectacular image quality on this site. So this um, picture here just shows you the area of land. Um, this is the red area marks the area around Paranal that Chile donated to ESO. Um, and there's a similar area in green here for Amazonas along with a protected area in purple that is reserved for um, ESO's um, development there. So how do things look uh, now? So obviously Amazonas, let me just go back as it was, does no longer look like that, which you see up here. Um, after a series and after quite some time of blasting the top of the telescope, um, they reached a plateau, uh, which is about 200 meters across where the telescope is being built. And here you see um, an artist's impression of how the telescope's construction might look like until it's finished. And this is being led by um, an Italian consortium who are basically building the uh, ELT dome and are responsible for the foundations and the construction. And this is basically uh, an image of what the site looked like. Um, I think this was early in 2020, uh, pre-COVID. And here you see from um, basically this movie that's, that's quite long, you won't see it all. Uh, you can find it on the ESO website, which is just several flybys of the site. Uh, things have come along quite well. 
Um, a lot of the foundations and the main structure foundation work is uh, progressing and in a good place. Um, currently, construction is paused due to the COVID pandemic. But we're hoping things will restart as uh, the COVID situation resolves. Um, here you also see other views of, of people working. And this is actually the, um, the technical facility of the ELT that's also being built where the mirror um, resurfacing and cleaning will happen on a daily basis. So I've mentioned kind of that we have these advantages of going to bigger and bigger mirrors. And, and again, here's a picture of the ELT foundations with kind of just um, the Milky Way and actually the sky that you see from Amazonas. And as you can see, it's just incredible, incredibly detailed and a wealth of information that we can derive from this incredible site. So how good will the ELT be? So what this um, sequence of images that I'm going to show you right now shows is basically um, kind of to reflect how um, how how good the zoom power of the ELT will be. So this is a, a typical region of the sky um, where they've just done a simulation just to show you what the improvement of the ELT would be. So this is about a one arc second region. And this is what you would see in what's called seeing limited mode that I'll talk about a bit shortly. Um, this is what HST would see in that area. Um, this is what the VLT would be able to see. So with its eight meter mirror, and this is what the ELT would see in that region. And if you can compare, you've gone from basically one big blur to really picking out kind of individual stars and colors of stars within this very complex region. So I hope that gives you a feeling of the zoom power of the telescope. But there's one big sticking point, um, which is the reason why HST is a, a space telescope as, as Webb will be as well but there's clearly atmosphere. So the same stuff that makes our stars twinkle as we view them, um, they're basically distorting the images that we see from the ground. So what I showed you earlier, the seeing limited is essentially reflecting that distortion. And what you see on the, on the screen right now is uh, a movie of basically a, a crater of the moon um, with atmospheric seeing. So that's what we actually observe. And yet when we look at it from space, we would actually see this amount of detail. So it's a bit like looking at the universe through a swimming pool. So we're always seeing these distorted images. And the same thing happens to stars. So this is what a typical star would look like. Uh, if you took lots and lots of very short exposures, you would just see it jumping around rather than the kind of point source that we expect to see for a star. So when we talk about telescope optics, what we're actually trying to do and what we're trying to do with adaptive optics is to go from this kind of distorted uh, image of stars to things that look way more compact. So this is basically what you see down here is what's called an airy pattern. So it's a diffraction pattern that actually is just dominated by the optics of the telescope. So what we want to do is basically improve our images so that we go from this to what's essentially the diffraction limited uh, image quality of the telescope itself. And that will allow us to get a lot more information because it increases our sensitivity instead of blurring out, but also allows us to maximize that detail we get from the larger primary mirror. This is just a quick um, animation actually from the Gemini Observatory that just explains how, um, how we do adaptive optics. So essentially what we do is that we know how, what the optics of our telescope is. So we can model it, we can understand it, we can put in uh, fake sources and see how that behaves. So we know that very well. We also know that stars that are far away are essentially point sources to those optics. So what a point source means is it's a very compact source of light. And if there was no atmosphere, what we would see is basically what we call a flat plane front wave front would come to our telescope so you'll see that coming in shortly so this is just showing the light beam and it will start monitoring a star so now that star is basically jumping around like it does because of the atmosphere so that plane wave front has actually now got kinks in it which you see here now what you can do is that you have a deformable mirror so that's a mirror that changes its shape on very fast time scales and by monitoring 
basically the light of a, a star that's coming in and knowing what the diffraction pattern should be, we can actually take the difference, invert it and put it on the surface of the telescope. And what that means is, uh, sorry, of the mirror, of the deformable mirror. So what that essentially means is that you can cancel out the effect of the blurring of the atmosphere. So you're basically just applying the inverse of what the atmosphere is doing to, to the star to your mirrored surface and it returns with a plane wave and therefore a diffraction limited high quality image. So if we were to look at kind of any region of sky, just as this example is trying to show. So this is basically um, the Hubble deep field, which is a deep field where Hubble pointed for many hours um, expecting a, on an apparently blank pot of sky, but essentially it was full of galaxies. But the key thing that's missing here is this field is, is very rare in stars. So there's a couple of stars here, but they're not usually bright enough to do this adaptive optics correction. So we have to overcome that somehow. And the way we do that is by creating our own stars. So laser guide stars. These are basically lasers that are fired up to the sodium layer um, in the atmosphere, which is about 80 kilometers above the surface of the earth. And these lasers basically excite the sodium atoms up there and create a fake star. And that means that, that we can then do that adaptive optics using that fake star rather than real stars or in combination with real stars to get good corrections um, across our field of view for the disturbance of the atmosphere. I just want to talk very briefly about um, some adaptive optics demonstrators that the UK have been particularly involved in. So this was a joint program um, with France and led by Richard Myers in Durham. And, and it basically tested uh, adaptive optics strategies or different strategies um, using lasers for the ELT on the William Herschel telescope that I talked about earlier. And I just wanted to highlight some of their very early results. So this I think is probably the first or second observation that they did of this multi-object um, adaptive optics. And basically what I want you just to take away from this is that this is a well-known galaxy called NGC 6240 that has um, a double nucleus and each of those nuclei are expected to host uh, or are thought to hold black, uh, host black holes. And if you compare basically the north um, nucleus and the southern nucleus, on the left here, you see HST, or Hubble Space Telescope images. And within, I think this exposure was about 20 minutes, you can see what you can get with adaptive optics at the WHT mirror. So you see a marked improvement in the quality of the imaging that you can obtain. I imagine that now on, instead of a 4.2 meter telescope, but a 39 meter telescope, it's a huge uh, potential for improvement. So again, just to give you a bit of feeling of, of what I mean by, um, how of the depth and also how with the fine level of detail we can resolve. So if we were to look at the Moltke crater, which you see up here, it's not far from the uh, Apollo landing site on the, on the moon. This crater, this little dot here is about six kilometers across. So I've shown a picture of a, a bus here and this tiny little red dot that you see down here is basically 10 times the size of what the ELT could resolve. So if, not that we would, if we were to point the ELT at the moon or at a lunar distance, we would be able to resolve scales about the size of a London bus. So about 10 meters across. And this tiny dot here is 10 times that size. So it again, gives you a kind of feeling for the kind of resolving power, the spatial detail we'll be able to see. In terms of sensitivity, if we were, to imagine the light change by uh, lighting a single flame of a candle, but we put that candle or that change of flux on the moon. Of course, we can't light a candle on the moon since there's no oxygen to burn, but let's just take that light level. The ELT would be able to detect that change in flux. So that's how sensitive it will be because of its light collecting area. So it's really this combination of focusing that seeing um, distorted or smeared uh, light into a much smaller compact point, along with the fact that we're collecting more photons gives us an incredible gain uh, in the sensitivity and the detail that we can see. 
So I'm going to move shortly uh, for the rest of the talk on to the kind of science drivers um, behind why we're going to these big telescopes. And basically the foundations of the ELT science case are built on three main pillars. Uh, the first is contemporary science. And what I mean by that is kind of science that we do now, but we know that we're limited in terms of our instrumentation and our telescope capability. And so these are questions that we know the ELT will be able to answer. Um, and so I'll talk about that shortly. So if we think about the, the universe in one slide, um, so this is what this plot basically shows, or a cartoon, it basically shows the Big Bang. And from the Big Bang, um, there's a period of inflation where rapid growth, which is what you see here. And then we see that um, basically the, the electrons and protons core to form hydrogen. And there's basically a period where the universe was completely neutral. There was no light. This is what we call the dark ages. Uh, then we see the first stars um, forming and the first galaxies. And these actually have the potential to ionize that neutral hydrogen. And that's what lets light flow through the universe. So basically the ELT is going to target science areas all the way from this kind of first light right through to the present day. So those kind of problems cover things like planets and stars, understanding uh, other planetary systems, understanding how they formed, also putting it in the context of our own solar system. Uh, we'll be looking at stars and galaxies um, to understand how and when they formed and, and what's caused the change in their uh, star forming and uh, mass growth over the universe and also what the nature of black holes are. And we'll also be looking at the very high redshift universe, the thing that I mentioned originally, um, the very first light, the first galaxies that formed, and also doing cosmology with the ELT that I'll talk about a bit later. The second foundation of the ELT science case is synergy with other facilities. Um, when Lucinda invited me, um, I think part of the invitation was also kind of like a forward look to the future of astronomy. Um, and while ELT is part of that, um, there's also many more facilities that will complement it. So the synergy that we're talking about here is that essentially ELT um, is po measuring part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is the figure that you see here. Um, it just shows from the radio right through to the gamma ray. And I think what's really always fascinated me for as long as I can remember is really how limited um, our view of the universe has been up until the last or the end of the last century. So the green box that's just popped up actually is the kind of ELT coverage in this uh, spectrum space, um, which still remains very narrow, but also our, our whole understanding of the universe has been basically limited to the visible range up until um, the 1950s and 60s or so. So just to put that in some context, this is a really nice compilation of a galaxy Centaurus A um, by Angel Lopez Sanchez. Um, and this basically, again, just reiterates that kind of narrow visible wavelength view. So this galaxy, when you look at it in the optical, it looks like basically very smooth uh, background light with some obviously something bright lying behind this kind of spectacular dust lane that lies across the center. For centuries, this is all we knew about this galaxy. Then with the birth of radio astronomy, something very different is going on in this galaxy. You see these huge plumes of radio emission that are coming out of the center of the galaxy and that was then reflected in the X-rays. Now it's slightly off axis, but you also see these kind of huge X-ray balloons, which basically means there's lots of high energy photons uh, around this system. And what these things are pointing to is that, and that we first kind of were able to see then in the mid-infrared. So the mid-infrared allows you to look through this basically dust that's blocking the light from the center of this galaxy. And it gets that then re-radiated by the dust into the mid-infrared. And that allows you to peer into the center. And there you see this very compact source, which we think is uh, an active galaxy or a black hole, an active galactic nucleus black hole. And this is what's basically this energetic um, activity is basically sending out these uh, hot photons as well as the radio continuum. 
and you can clearly see this very compact source in the center in the infrared. So when we now look at, you can see when we go back to this optical light, uh, image, to what we actually see now in this multi-wavelength view, we've had a kind of distorted view of what the emission from objects in the universe has been. And basically the ELT sits in um, a much wider um, landscape of multi-wavelength telescopes that can look at the universe in all its light. And these are just, you know, these are just some, this is a selection of some of the telescopes that will be online and are currently online or coming online in the next decade, including the Webb Space Telescope and Rubin, um, as well as ALMA and LOFAR, which are currently operational and SKA, which will also start within this decade. And together, we'll be able to look at um, astronomy in a much more multi-wavelength but complete way. And really it will change our understanding of the universe. And in particular, Rubin Telescope will be actually taking a movie of the sky, a 10 year movie of the sky that's uh, available to it to survey. And this again will include a new dimension to what we're seeing in the universe in that we'll also be able to look at time variable sources in a way that we haven't been able to thus far. The final pillar of the ELT science case is actually something that we can't really say what it is. It's just stuff that we know or we don't know. It's stuff we're going to discover. It's stuff we can't predict. We can't even think about. And this really is going to deliver probably the most fundamental changes to our understanding of the universe and will be the most exciting part of what the ELT will deliver. Now I'm running a little bit short of time, so I might have to rush through this a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to go back to those science drivers and just walk through about three, well, four or five different science cases, starting with planets and stars, uh, stars and galaxies, and then galaxies and cosmology. So a lot of excitement uh, over the last couple of decades has been in the discovery of extrasolar planets. And when I was doing my PhD, uh, there were no known extrasolar planets. And now this is probably one of the most booming areas of astrophysical research um, that is currently underway. So understanding how extrasolar planets and their systems formed is a key goal. Um, we now know um, several thousands of extrasolar planets in our universe, um, and they basically can be seen in an inferred way. Usually we look at the light from their parent star and see what the impact of the planet rotating around it is doing to that light to infer its properties. Um, but with the ELT, we'll actually be able to directly look at some of the reflected light from some of those extrasolar planets. So we want to ask questions like, how do planetary systems form? How common are they? How common are systems like our own solar system? Um, of those extrasolar planets that we've found, what are their atmospheres like? Are there other Earths? And can we detect signs of life? All really exciting and fundamental questions. Um, this is related to kind of the formation of galaxies. And this is actually, um, again, it looks kind of like a simulated image, but this is actual real data from the ALMA telescope, which is an array of millimeter telescopes. And these are the disks, the dusty disks from which extrasolar planets form. And I just find this image spectacular. And I was talking a bit earlier about synergy, and here we have a synergy with the ELT in the sense that one of the instruments, the mid-infrared instrument, METIS, will also be looking at the um, dusty disks of galaxies where these disks will emit. And because of the resolution, the high resolution, we'll be able to get maybe not as good as this, but reasonably good um, imaging from the ELT on the, on the disks within which uh, planets are forming. We'll also be able to look at stars and, and I mentioned, sorry, extrasolar planets and think about their, um, the planets around them and if they actually exist in the, the zone of hability, which you see here. So this is the habitable zone um, as a function of um, a star's mass. So here you see the sun and its solar system. This is another star and its planets. And one of these lies within the potential habitable zone of that star. And this is the Trappist system, which has, you may have heard of a couple of years ago, actually had, uh, I think, three or four Earth-like 
planets or rocky planets. Now, these are very hard to see. So typically with um, extrasolar planets, we're able to look at kind of gas giants, so like super Jupiters. Um, and this was one of the first where we were able to actually look at things that are more Earth-like. Um, and we'll be able to look at these, some of these things directly. I'm going to skip over some of these slides in the interest of time. Um, but this basically is relating to how we actually observe things with the ELT. So I mentioned imaging spectrographs, and uh, this is kind of just a technique that will be used for harmony to disentangle kind of atmospheric variations that you see up here that will basically, as this loops through wavelength to longer wavelengths, you'll see the atmospheric and the instrumental effects moving outwards. Um, but the actual planet or the companion here actually stays in the same place. So by doing imaging spectroscopy, you can actually identify a real exoplanet from these kind of aberration or optical effects that you see in the integral field data. I'm gonna skip this a little bit. Um, I'm gonna move on to galaxies. Um, and basically one of the big questions is, so this is a slide by Joe Liska, just showing a compilation of kind of the menagerie and the diversity that we see within galaxies. Um, we still, we know already that the universe experienced a phase, which you kind of see here, that it went from these very blue star forming galaxies to galaxies that were com more common now in the present day that are more evolved, um, that aren't forming very young stars, but are basically their stars are just evolving in a very passive way. So there's been a fundamental change in the universe around this point, and we still don't have a full picture why that is. And these things that um, the ELT will be able to address. One thing that we think has had an impact is basically black holes um, have affected, we think, on a large scale galaxies in terms of shutting down their active star formation. So we think at some point massive galaxies have had a black hole phase, um, or contain them presently. And that has basically expelled the gas or heated up the gas such that um, new stars could no longer form. So I'm just gonna skip to um, some results and potential results from the ELT uh, or the ELTs on the Galactic Center that I'm sure you're aware won the Nobel Prize this year. Um, but basically these are just movies of what's going on in our own Galactic Center where there's a 10 to the six um, black hole, 10 to 6 solar mass black hole. Basically, these movies that you see are from the Genzel group um, at the bottom that basically show their tracking of stars moving around this apparently dark uh, black hole at the center of our galaxy. And this is again afforded by the large mirror of the VLT with adaptive optics. And that's allowed them to basically track and see the motion of stars. Um, with, around these central black holes. And this actually is, is quite out of date now, as you see, it's 2003. Um, and they've really progressed from here to see what the gravitational effects around that central massive black hole is. And this is a simulation from um, Andrea Gess's group, um, who also was one of the winners of the Nobel Prize, um, that showed basically what the ELT or in this case, a 30 meter ELT or the 30 meter telescope would be able to achieve with adaptive optics. And here you see that clear improvement on both the number of, of stars that you can then see in, in the centers of galaxies. And this is for the, our own Milky Way, but we'll also be able to track not at this much detail, but also the motions of, of stars in some nearby galaxies with black holes too. Um, we'll be able to constrain black hole masses for many of those. Um, I'm gonna skip quickly through this, um, just in terms of the first galaxies. So I mentioned, you know, while we can detect the first galaxies that you see in this uh, montage up here, you can see they're really, really compact. And this is done with some of the best telescopes and space telescopes that we have now. You can see, even though they're quite small, you do see evidence of some kind of structures in these, but they look very different to the galaxies that I showed you in the montage before. And actually with the ELT, we'll be able to really look at the structural properties of these galaxies. Here's some simulations of what the uh, first light imager will be able to do, uh, redshifts of about two to three. 
um, but we'll also be able to apply this to some of the very first galaxies. So I'm just going to skip to one um, last result, which is um, one of the cosmological expectations of what we'll be able to do with the ELT. Now, if we go back to this kind of bell jar view, um, what you can see here is um, basically this envelope here is kind of representing the size of the universe. And at this point here, we think that there's some kind of unknown force that we call dark energy that is actually causing the universe to accelerate faster than we would expect. And the cause of this dark energy is not yet known. Um, and the ELT will be able to discuss this in the sense it will actually make a direct measure of the expansion of the universe. Now, this is done by looking at bright quasars, which are distant black holes. And basically along this line of sight, there's actually a lot of matter in the universe that basically blocks light as when we see it, as the light from the quasar travels through, each time there's this gas in filaments and in structure, it absorbs a bit of light. So you end up seeing these dips in the, in the light coming from the quasar. And this is what this is blown up to show down here. So it's like a very small area of one of these spectra. And each of these dips here corresponds to gas basically in the universe along the line of sight. Now, if I just flick between this and the next slide, hopefully you can see that very small shift. And what that small shift is, is the expansion of the universe. Now that small shift that I've just shown you actually, unfortunately, is quite amplified in that it's actually a million years of observing to see that small shift. Um, but actually if we monitor about 25, or oh, sorry, 30 quasars um, over a period of 25 years, uh, intermittently, not for a full 25 years, um, we'll be able to basically measure that direct expansion. So this is quite a fundamental way of observing, of actually checking what is happening in terms of dark energy and the actual fabric of the universe by watching the actual universe expand in real time. So I'm sorry for the whirlwind science uh, review at the end, but I hope that's given you a flavor of what the ELT will be able to achieve, um, both in terms of, and how fascinating it is in its technology, as well as the science it will deliver. Um, down here, when we actually get back to real life again, and we can visit the RAS again, this is the courtyard of the RAS with the footprint of the ELT primary. It's about the same size as the courtyard. So the next time you're there, please do imagine the ELT in that space. And as I mentioned before, the ELT is just one part of a really exciting future landscape for astronomy. And I think the next decade is really gonna be groundbreaking. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Verma. That was incredibly <laughs> fascinating. Um, absolutely informative. So much information. I'm going to use that little picture there um, and <laughs> of the RIS. Thank you for doing that. Um, uh, for educational reasons, uh, when we were back at RIS, that's just fantastic. I'll have to think about that every time I get back there. So if it's okay if I stop uh, your share screen. Sure. Yeah. And um, uh, we definitely uh, have some questions. And uh, I would like to, um, I know we uh, definitely went past time, which is not a problem. Hopefully you guys can still stick with us while we uh, do a QA. and a um, We have them both in YouTube and on uh, Zoom. One of them that kind of I saw again and again, and I think you did talk about, you know, the, the narrow type of light that the ELT is looking at, but we got this question again and again. They just want to know, um, can it look at radio or gamma rays found in space? What are the parts of electromagnetic spectrum might it be looking at? so yeah no it's it's definitely just that narrow range that I showed but I think the way to kind of view it is that different facilities will be working together so for example gamma ray bursts or even the new gravitational wave astronomy which is a whole new area of astronomy that's just been born um, you can see that for some of those all these telescopes working at different wavelengths got together to take observations of these really interesting sources so it, it should be viewed as kind of like one element of a, a huge cohort of, of facilities that cover the electromagnetic wave. So while we can't see the radio or the gamma rays, we can look for the optical counterparts. So say, for example, it, it one of those um, went off in a galaxy. 
we wouldn't see the burst, but we may see the galaxy that hosts it. Yeah, you see part of it, and you work together, you're collaborating with other uh, telescopes to find out more information. We all do our part. I think it's uh, fantastic. And I'm really excited for the future of uh, adaptive optics. It was so incredible. I forgot there was going to be lasers in this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Something to definitely highlight next time when we do an intro. Okay, so the next question, um, which is a really great question. Um, you mentioned that they have to clean those mirrors. And it was your images were so great with the size comparisons. Um, I have colleagues back in California who who have uh, created their own lenses for their telescopes, right? And they talk about you know, how much it takes for polishing and how long and the, the work. And then you showed this great gigantic one with people standing on it. And then you showed us, you know, much more comparisons of like, but how the how it got thinner and, and better. Um, but they were asking questions like, you know, how do they keep it clean? Is there special coatings on it? Do you know of anything about how do they prevent like dirt sticking on it? Even though they have to get clean, is there any sort of special additive? Well. Yeah, I think they're kind of, because it's in the desert, then yes, dust will be around, but they also take measures in terms of, I believe, I'm, I'm not sure if there's kind of anti-dust coatings, I'm not quite sure, I guess so. Um, but also they have kind of, um, uh, well, it's a windshield, but it also kind of will prevent any kind of major dust coming in, but there, will, there always are in every telescope, there's always dust that lands on the mirror um, and that's expected and it's factored into its performance. Um, and so every astronomical mirror is cleaned at some point. It's just in the case of this segmented one, because there's so many, you couldn't basically shut down the whole telescope and clean it all at once. That's why they've decided on this um, kind of uh, one to two a day renewal. And that basically involves cleaning and preserving the surface in a good quality so that each time you make a change, you know that not everything will be perfectly clean, but a lot of it will be in a good shape. And there's actually a spare set of mirrors that they will also rotate within this. So again, it's just about preserving the image quality by maintaining that mirror surface um, to be as clean as possible. So you can't, you can't avoid it to some degree. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that it would just uh, make up for that and expect it and work with it um, or around it. Um, but it's, you mentioned how amazingly engineered this thing is, and they really thought of everything about, you know, while it's still in use, you're going to be cleaning part by part. Um, I think that's just amazing. Um, one of the your animations about the light and how many different mirrors that light's going to be bounced off was just uh, absolutely fascinating. I'd never seen a telescope work bounce off that many mirrors before, I think it was five. Yeah. Um, and questions about that too. So is there any light lost uh, due to so many reflections? Um, how, what's the effectiveness of this telescope? And then someone else asked a really good question about this too, um, is do you deal with any interference when the light comes across the primary mirror? Um, so really good questions about that. So, th so the five mirror design comes from a design to make the whole system feasible. So it, it actually makes the, the primary mirror quite fast. So that's why there's so many folds, but naturally, yes, there will be a reduction in light. If you have a three mirror or a two mirror system compared to a five, yes, there will be that slight reduction, um, but it wasn't, you know, again, it was factored into the design and it just meant that the ELT was buildable and that it would be very fast in terms of its optics. So. Um, it's it's kind of like, I mean, it's kind of what they do in the design studies. They do a trade-off of different systems to see that they will, you know, what will give them as near to um, a buildable and workable system as they can do. So, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to recall the other bits of the question, um, but I think in terms of the... I think it was about interference on the primary. Yeah, so when the, when the light finally goes across the primary mirror, the, the last part of where the light travels uh, for, uh, for analysis, they're wondering if it interferes with incoming light. No, there shouldn't be. So again, there's, you know, it's kind of designed to, the, or the mirror kind of beams are designed such that they don't interfere with each other. Um, so it should, We'll be fine. Yeah, I'm sure. And also kind of the design of the primary <laughs> is such that um, it, it's a very complex system, as I showed you. So um, yeah. that will focus the light right up to um, the secondary mirror and, and so on. 
so I, I forgot to mention actually the M4 mirror in the ELT system is where that def deformation due to adaptive optics will be. So the M3 then sends it to M4, which is constantly moving. Um, uh, and then the M5 gets it in its nice pristine condition that you want to view it in. Yeah, and wow. M5 basically just does nothing. It just points it either way. So it's not actually changing the power of the um, actual light. Yeah, I, I've always, you know, I, I know about a bit of adaptive optics in my uh, schooling, but I never knew that you could choose which mirror would do it. And I never even thought it would be a smaller mirror than, uh, you know, the one collecting all the light. I, I found that really amazing. Of course you could do that. It makes a lot of sense. So I think um, the difference, be sorry to interrupt, um, no, but no. the difference between the ELT and, and say the Gemini movie that I showed you is there, they're doing the correction after you've collected all the light. So you've got the light from, the star and then you're passing it through the adaptive optic system to um to where you collect the data whereas with the elt it's actually built into that five mirror system so the light that comes out of to the instruments at m5 is already corrected so that's one that's why it's called an adaptive telescope yeah they've really thought of everything uh, yes. it's pretty amazing. Uh, we are, we've gone quite long. We we're losing some of our audience. So let's just do three more minutes if that's okay with you. Um, let's see. Oh, we had lasers, a question about laser beams. Uh, are they needed to cover the whole collecting area of 39 meter mi mirror? I mean, I think it only has, does it have four? What is, what's, what it has four, it? but it's not really to cover the mirror area. It's basically um, to, well, Four, I think, initially were funded and now there are six planned. I think the final version will have six. Um, but basically um, what, what you need to do is kind of project that 39 meters onto the sky. And that basically makes a patch which is about 10 arc minutes across. And what those six lasers do kind of, they can fill that 10 arc minutes, not in terms of their light fills it. It just means that you can put artificial stars where you want them within that 10 minute patrol field uh, or the field of view and that means that by the combination of natural stars with laser guide stars means that you can correct over that field of view now with a single natural star basically you're really correcting a very small beam I don't know if you recall that slide where I showed this kind of conical tube of where the laser light's coming out but basically it really only collect, uh, corrects that little patch directly around it Whereas when you've got a mixture of multiple lasers and natural stars, you can correct quite a, a, or a much larger area of that field of view. And obviously it depends on how bright things are, um, but you, can, you don't get brilliant correction all the way out to the edges, but you can do a much wider area. And that's related to the canary observations I showed you, where they use multi-objects to correct a wider field of view than just that single cone. Excellent. Um, yeah, really interesting technology. Um, uh, good question here about a postgraduate astronomy students. How can they partake in research using ELT in the future? Um, we want you. There's going to be so much science to be done. And even, you know, school kids who are thinking about astronomy as careers, really, by the time you're hitting the undergraduate and postgraduate phase, this is the time that hopefully we'll be getting ELT data in. So, Currently, there's a lot of work in design and kind of simulating science cases. So there are ELT related projects out there. Um, and in the future, you know, the world's your oyster. There'll be plenty of groups that are, are looking for people to work on ELT data. Um, and hopefully we'll also be, I haven't really discussed this, but I imagine we'll be able to do some citizen science with it as well. So even anyone who, who's happy to do citizen science in their free time will be welcome to look at ELT data. Yeah, I imagine uh, there's gonna be so much data to go through uh, that we're gonna need as many people, professional and amateur, um, to look at uh, what's available and, and to help us find the things. So you can look at data over and over again and see different things. Uh, so it depends on what you're, yeah. So there's definitely a lot of future in any data research that comes back from, uh, so what, when should we look forward to kind of seeing the first data coming back from ELT, do you think? So the current schedule is mid or 2025. Um, but as I mentioned, that doesn't include any COVID related de delays. So there's no official revised timeline yet, but I'm hoping certainly by 2025, 26, 
fingers crossed, they'll be the first ELT images that you'll see in the news and uh, around the web. Excellent. We're going to end it there. I have copied and pasted uh, the rest of the questions for Dr. Verma. She can answer them. Maybe we can post them on the YouTube uh, channel once we post our final video. Uh, Dr. Verma, it has been an absolute pleasure and I look forward to hearing you again because it was so amazing and informative and fascinating um, and just so wonderful to, for something to look forward to in times like these um, and all the science that we're going to get. And just, you know, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. It was a real pleasure. And yeah, sorry for going over time to everyone. No, I didn't want you to stop, to be honest. I was like, yeah, something more.